Hello everyone and welcome to PC Retro Tech. In this week's video I'm going to be repairing a few parts that I have lying around that aren't working. Uh, the first of those is a CGI graphics card, so really quite a high value target. Uh, now I didn't pay very much for this because it wasn't working. Uh, and I also have an EGA card, uh, so this is nothing particularly special, it's just a Paradise uh, EGA card. Uh, but unfortunately when I plug this into the machine, uh, it doesn't even start up, as in the machine doesn't start. Uh, so this means there's a dead short on this card, so that might be easy to fix. Uh, this one unfortunately is a little bit different. Uh, I'll show you a little later uh, what it actually does when we try to run it. Now, uh, the reason I know it's CGA is because it says CGA D01 on the sticker. Um, now, that's not quite such a hilarious thing. Uh, there is actually a clock crystal here, and I'll show you a little bit in a moment that you wouldn't normally expect that on a CGA graphics card. Uh, this is the famous 6845 CRT controller. Uh, that's the chip that does all the work, really. And uh, there's a whole lot of chips here neatly laid out in rows, which look for all the world like they must be the memory for the card. Uh, but if you have a look at the uh, numbering on the chips themselves, uh, these are all 74LS series chips, which means that these are logic chips. And in fact, all of these chips running all the way around here are all 74LS. So that doesn't leave very much. Uh, there's this one here, which is clearly some kind of ROM. Uh, I guess it's a, even an EEPROM since it has a sticker over it and what looks like a little window underneath. Uh, but uh, there are only two other chips on here that could be the memory. So unless there's something very, very special about this particular 6845, which I doubt, uh, the memory has to be here. Uh, so we'll check that. Uh, but first let me show you the other CGA cards that I have and we can do a bit of a comparison. These are the other three CGA graphics cards that I have and these are all in working order of course. Uh, this one is an IBM one uh, from an original IBM PC, a 5150 machine. And uh, the other two are multi-tech. Uh, now there's not very much difference between these in performance. Uh, one of these is a little bit later than the other and has uh, a slightly different character set uh, in the ROM uh, and it also has dual ported RAM so that there's no snow in the 80 by 25 text mode but other than that there isn't a huge difference between these three cards uh, so you have the 6845 CRT controller chip in each case and the ROMs seem to be pretty easy to spot uh, so I have gone through and checked uh, for the RAM in each case. Uh, in the case of the original IBM, it's these chips here. So there are eight of these, and these are one-bit chips. Uh, so they're 16 kilobits by one, uh, which gives you a total of uh, a byte, because there are eight of them, uh, times 16K, which is 16 kilobytes. Uh, these chips here are actually four-bit chips. Uh, so... Uh, you still end up with a total of 8 bits, it's just now uh, set into two chips. And so these are 16K by 4 bits. And these ones are different again. Uh, those chips are actually 8-bit uh, chips. And uh, there are just 8 kilobytes in each case. The other thing to notice, as I said, there are no clock crystals on these. And that's because the CGI graphics cards normally derive their clock frequency from the machine itself. Uh, you know, in the original PC that was at 4.77 MHz, of course, and it just derives it from the, the ISA bus here. So it's interesting that there is a clock chip on that other card, even though it says CGA. So it'd be interesting to get to the bottom of that. Well, we already have a bit of a mystery to solve. I looked up those two chips that I pointed out earlier, which I said must be the memory chips. And indeed they are. These are the CDM6116 chips. Uh, the ones that are on the board are actually AE3, not AC3, but I can easily check that these are the same things. Uh, there are lots of people who want to sell me the AE3s, and they all say that they're 2048 word by 8-bit static RAM chips. Now, this is uh, weird because that means that there's 2 kilobytes of memory in each of those chips, and given that there are only 2 chips, uh, we only have 4 kilobytes. Now, a CGA card would have 16 kilobytes, uh, so that is a mystery indeed, and combined with the fact that we had that clock crystal, which you wouldn't expect to see on a CGA card, uh, there's something very unusual going on here indeed. 
Uh, so perhaps we have to get this card working uh, to get to the bottom of this mystery. Well, I've plugged the card into my XT machine and hooked up my IBM CGA monitor. Uh, the flashing you see at the moment is uh, just the camera and the machine is actually off. So I'm just going to switch it on and you can see what happens. Uh, so first of all, the machine is frozen. The num lock, caps lock, scroll lock are all just remain lit. Uh, the hard drive doesn't seek. Uh, nothing happens. Uh, and on the screen you can see that there's some kind of rolling sync problem here. So I think I have to conclude, based on all the evidence that I have, that this is actually not a CGA card. Uh, it looks to me like it's some kind of uh, monochrome card. Uh, and that would explain everything that we've seen. The fact that it only has four kilobytes of memory, uh, the fact that it has a clock crystal on it, and the fact that the CJ monitor doesn't work with this card. Uh, but it doesn't explain why the card is not allowing the machine to post. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is adjust the jumper settings in my machine uh, to uh, a monochrome setting and see whether or not that makes any difference. Well, it didn't have any luck with the dip switch settings in my XT. Uh, there's the same result every time, uh, even in monochrome mode. So I put it into my 286 machine, and as you can see, uh, I no longer have scrolling lines across the screen. Uh, it's still blank, uh, there's no picture or text, uh, but that may just be because this monitor is not compatible with it, as we suspect. Uh, but the important thing is that this 286 actually boots with this card in there. Uh, I can actually hear the drives whirring away and it'll do a floppy seek and uh, you can actually uh, hear the drive going into DOS. Uh, so it seems that the BIOS in my 286 uh, is going to cooperate with this card whereas the one in the XT is not. Uh, so I'm going to stick with this machine for now and obviously the next thing I have to do is to try and find a monitor uh, which I can connect up uh, that will be compatible with a monochrome graphics card. Now I do have this Amstrad PCMD monochrome monitor which will hopefully do the trick for us but it is unfortunately itself not working. Uh, when I power it on absolutely nothing happens and so I suspect that it has a blown fuse which should be easy enough to replace. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and do that but of course the standard warning applies uh, when working on CRTs uh, there are some very specific risks which you have to be aware of and if you don't uh, know about those you should never open one of these yourself. Well the first thing that I've done is check that fuse which is down in here and uh, that's fine. Uh, I've also looked for bulging and leaky caps and there's nothing like that and the caps seem to charge up the way you'd expect them to. I also went ahead and checked uh, all of the diodes and the larger bulkier resistors they all seem to be uh, roughly in spec. Uh, so the only hint that I have is this transformer here makes a buzzing and crackling sound after you switch the monitor off uh, for a few seconds. Uh, that doesn't seem normal. And uh, the other hint that I have is that the picture tube doesn't make that characteristic sound that you get when a picture tube comes on. Now I have checked that there is high voltage getting to this tube, so that's not the issue. Uh, so I'm beginning to suspect the problem is at this end of the tube and perhaps there's a voltage rail missing or maybe one of the driver transistors has died, uh, something like that. So there are obviously some uh, larger components uh, here that are heat synced and I don't know what this one does uh, but I assume that these are either driver transistors or more probably voltage regulators. Uh, so I'm going to check the voltage rails and uh, see if that gives me any hints uh, and I'll try and figure out what this thing actually does. Well, I have made some progress. So it seems that there's a three pin connector and a four pin connector on the other side of this little PCB here on the back of the picture tube. And uh, there are some cables that go uh, from there down onto the main board. And uh, it seems that the fourth pin on this four pin connector should be 12 volt supply. And at the moment, uh, I'm only getting a few millivolts, uh, which doesn't seem quite right. Uh, that would explain why I'm not seeing any light uh, inside the picture tube when it starts up and why I'm not hearing that characteristic sound that you get uh, when it's switched on. Uh, so I think that's probably the issue. There's probably a problem with uh, the 12 volt rail. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and see if I can uh, figure out where the voltage regulators are for the 12 volt rail 
and uh, see whether they're operating. Well, I've spent quite a bit of time on this now and uh, I've managed to trace a few things through. So the 12 volt rail should come from a regulator which is strapped to this big heat sink here but it should have 13.4 volts on its input and it currently doesn't and that in turn should come via a diode from this transformer but I don't even have a reasonable voltage on the primary, the, the input side of this transformer so that implies that there's something wrong with this portion so that the mains comes in here and apart from a few support components around here there's really just uh, what I think is a rectifier here for giving DC voltage uh, there's uh, four diodes and a big capacitor uh, the only other thing is this big IC and this turns out to be an offline switching regulator according to the data sheet and it's used in television power supplies um, so this could well be faulty it's an 80 watt IC uh, so very heavy duty uh, but uh, I suspect it's faulty because none of the voltages on the pins are correct uh, so if everything before that is okay and everything after it's not there's a good chance that that's the thing that's gone unfortunately I don't have a replacement for that and I don't have another similar monitor that I can pull one out to try uh, so until I get one of those I can't do anything any more with this monitor today and unfortunately I just don't have any other monochrome monitors well it's a few days later and I've just decided to go ahead and replace the IC, the STK7358 which is the power supply IC, uh, that's this one here that goes onto this big heat sink and I measured that there uh, is over 300 volts on this capacitor here, it's just rectified AC you have four diodes in a full bridge rectifier and uh, that seems right so I'm going to leave that alone and I'm going to guess that either this IC or this transformer are dead and it just seems like a waste of time given that the ICs are readily available and very very cheap, only a few euros uh, to not go ahead and replace that straight away and just eliminate that as being a problem well the pins that I need to desolder are these 14 in a row here uh, but unfortunately the IC is still connected to the heatsink so that may be a problem uh, it depends on how much heat they suck up and whether my desoldering equipment can handle that. Uh, the heatsink is actually screwed on but the screws are inaccessible and so it may be quite difficult to get those out uh, before I have a go at desoldering. So I'm just going to have a go at it and see what happens. <laughs> And there it is, uh, one extra pin that I missed, uh, but that was all that was required and just unscrew the heat sink at the bottom and out it came. So let's get this switched over and solder in the new one. Well the 14 pins that I need to solder are along here in a line and I had to pull them out a little bit. Uh, they're spring loaded and so uh, you can actually extend them a little and they needed to be pulled just a little bit to come through the board and so now there are just 14 pins uh, to put solder on and hopefully the heatsink won't take too much heat away from my soldering iron also there's quite a risk of a short here so I'm just going to be uh, applying a small amount of solder to these pins uh, it just needs to hold them on and make a good connection, it doesn't need to be overly done and we'll see whether uh, we get this to work well I'm going to switch it on and see whether we get smoke or a warm sound or nothing at all uh, so here goes Well what's curious is I'm not getting that weird sound from the transformer but I'm getting no sound at all. Uh, it's almost as if there is no voltage there whatsoever. Uh, so that's a little bit strange. Uh, that seems to indicate that that IC is not working at all uh, since we can't have made it worse than it already was. Uh, so that's not very encouraging unfortunately. So there seems to be something else uh, amiss here. Well as it turns out one of the fuse resistors here actually went open circuit 
And so I've also replaced that. Now that wasn't the problem earlier. That seems to have developed at some point uh, while I've been working on this. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how, but probably when uh, discharging this capacitor, uh, that's caused this to fry. Uh, so anyway, now I have that replaced and I'm going to give this another go and see whether uh, we get sparks and or sound. Well, I certainly hear sounds that are correct, uh, so I'm going to call that on. Uh, so now we need to connect it up to a system and see whether we get any picture on the screen. It's time for a bit of an update, and what I've done is replace the two opto diodes down in here. Uh, these are the black plastic flat things you can see at the bottom in front of the heatsink there. And uh, they look like this out of circuit. They're TLP580s, and basically, as I understand it, they have a little LED or some kind of light uh, inside the package on one side. And on the other side, they have a little light-sensitive piece of silicon. And that allows you to couple things, uh, you know, optically rather than electrically, uh, which sort of separates, um, say, high voltage from low voltage circuitry. Uh, that's my understanding of what they do. Um, I've not used them in circuits before, so uh, I'm a little bit uh, scarce on the details there. Uh, but when I replaced these, the main fuse down in here blew, and uh, I did replace that, and it hasn't blown again. Uh, but it is a little bit of a hint, I think, that when these were replaced, the fuse went. And uh, the only guess that I have at the moment is that there's something wrong with this transformer. It's the only large uh, component that would be, you know, subject to heating, uh, you know, or uh, maybe shorting uh, that could be faulty. And especially given the noises that come out of that, uh, it's a guess that there's something wrong with it. So I'm going to have a look and see whether I have one uh, that I can replace it with. Well, I had a check and I don't have a replacement for this transformer, unfortunately. In fact, I can find no information about it anywhere except in the manual for this uh, monitor. And uh, this is an 8142012 and the Amstrad PCCM monitors, and I happen to have a spare one of those for parts, uh, is an 8142011. And so I suspect these are custom transformers that were built just for this monitor uh, because I can't find any information on them elsewhere. And unfortunately the windings on the other one are different and so is the pinout. Uh, so uh, it's really only a transformer from this monitor as far as I can see uh, that's going to work in this. So given that I can't get one of those and that that's now my best guess as to what's wrong with this thing, it could also be something wrong with the circuitry uh, that activates those optodiodes, I guess. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, I have no other really good guesses here. And so it seems like the easiest way to repair this is going to be to find another monitor where the CRT uh, doesn't work particularly well, but the uh, board is okay and then to mix and match uh, but that's going to be a long-term project uh, not something I'm going to be able to work on uh, immediately unfortunately I have to wait for another monitor that's suitable to come up uh, so in the meantime I'm going to get back to that EGA graphics card and see if I can get that to operate first things first let me show you what happens when I put the EGA card that's not working into my XT machine here I'm just going to plug it into the uh, spare riser slot at the end here. There's no video card in there. And I won't plug a monitor in, but I'll just switch on the machine and you can see what happens. So it's probably not very easy to see on video, but the fan and the power supply did a single revolution and then stopped. And so this means that there's a dead short on the card for sure. Well, I've watched enough YouTube videos on old computers by now to know that if you have a short, the first thing to check are the capacitors. And there are one, two, three, four, five tantalums that I can see here, which are obviously prime suspects. Uh, the other thing I know about this is that there was a dead bug around about here on the uh, board, and it, it actually fried onto the contacts here. 
Uh, so it's possible that that caused some damage to some of these RAM chips here and that may also explain what's going on. So uh, that's in the back of my mind, but let's start with the obvious things, namely uh, the capacitors and see whether they're okay. Well, I put my multimeter into continuity mode and if you hear any beeps, uh, then there's a short. So nothing on that capacitor. Seems okay. Seems fine. No problems there. And that sounds a bit suspicious. So let's lift that capacitor out and see whether that could be our problem. Well, that was a bit stubborn to get out, but I did manage it in the end. And let's just see whether we have a short. And we do indeed. So this is definitely a dead capacitor. So let's stick the board into the machine again and see whether we get a different response this time. Well, this time I've plugged the monitor in and I'll switch that on and we'll see whether we actually get a picture as well because that capacitor may have just been for smoothing and not actually used for anything critical. So, no, it looks like it was. Oh, wait a sec. Uh, well, certainly the machine is starting up. Uh, I'm not getting any picture, but uh, that is definitely an improvement over what we had. Uh, so the machine is booting, and uh, I guess uh, it could also be that I have... Ah, I just have the brightness down. Uh, look at that. Uh, so it's actually working. Uh, wow, okay. So what I'm going to do is now just replace that capacitor, and now we have a working EGA card, which I have to say um, I really didn't expect. But of course we have to run some games and check whether there has been any damage to that memory uh, and see whether everything's working okay. Uh, but so far it's looking pretty good. Well it's not a perfect match uh, but I've put in another tantalum here and I know there are going to be people screaming at me for replacing a tantalum with another fault prone tantalum but uh, it's just how I prefer to do things, uh, unless there's some specific reason why that would be a bad idea. Uh, I like to replace things with something that looks relatively close to how it did originally. Uh, anyway, let's uh, plug this into the machine and check that it still works. And indeed, those are all the right sounds. Uh, so it looks like we have a working EGA card. So let's do some tests and see whether that memory has been damaged. Actually, before we run any tests, let's take a look at what we have here. And it's a Paradise chipset. There's not a lot to say about it. It's a Paradise 38315B. Uh, it says PEGA2A. And obviously, this is the ROM here. Uh, there are eight RAM chips, and these, I've looked up, they're actually 4-bit RAM chips, and uh, each of them is 64K by 4 bits, and so if you do the math, that works out to 64 kilobytes by 4, which is a total of 256 kilobytes. Uh, so that's all we can really say about it. Uh, let's plug it in, and uh, we'll do some speed tests, and also just some tests to make sure that games are working and that there's no damage here. Now the first thing I'm going to do here is run Grand Prix Circuit which has an EGA mode and this will just allow us to give a quick test to make sure that the EGA memory is basically okay. Uh, now I actually made a video about the Enhanced Graphics Adapter uh, some time back and it's one of my most popular videos by far and I always wondered why that was and it turns out that the video was picked up by a website called vjamuseum.info and they actually link to our video uh, at the bottom of one of their EGA pages. Uh, so uh, that explains why there's been so many views uh, of the video, I think. Uh, and of course, uh, it's just something that's appealed to subscribers. Uh, so anyway, uh, in 
1987 this card came out according to VJ Museum and uh, they have the exact same card that I do uh, it's identical there are other versions of it uh, it was made by Western Digital and uh, it was actually released 16th of February 1987 Bear in mind that uh, VJ came out in 1987, so this was a late EJ card, and EJ itself came out in 1984, and this card uh, retailed for $599, and as we know, the original IBM EJ card was a full-length card, and this is, you know, very much smaller with VLSI technology and so on. Uh, so this card apparently adds a 640-480 EJ mode. Uh, that won't run on this monitor, of course. This is a CJ monitor. Uh, but I'll hook up an EJ monitor a little bit later, and we'll see if we can get that mode to work. Uh, there's also a 132-column text mode, which wouldn't have been standard uh, EGA. Uh, so quite a lot of interesting information there on uh, vjmuseum.info. Uh, but it looks like everything's working just fine here, so uh, let's go and check out uh, the performance of this card. My go-to for benchmarking video speed these days on these really early systems is uh, Top Bench, and that stands for the old school PC benchmark, by the way. And uh, it has a database of a whole load of different computers, or you can just run it in real-time benchmarking mode, and it will give you uh, a number of figures uh, for how long things take. So there's a memory test, uh, the, you know, opcodes for the CPU. They don't even do 3D games uh, to try to give you some idea of how fast they're going to run. Uh, but the one we're interested in here is video memory speed. And it's telling me that the video memory speed is around about 1650, 1660 microseconds. Uh, so we can even put that into the database here if we wanted to. I won't do that now. Uh, but what I'm going to do is change out the EJ card that's in here. Uh, this is my 10 MHz XT, by the way. And I'm going to put in an original IBM EJ card, and we'll see whether there's any difference in performance between the two. This is my original IBM EJ card, and I believe that these only had 64 kilobytes of memory instead of the 256 that we've got in the Paradise one. Uh, but otherwise, it should be a standard EGA implementation by definition, because IBM invented this standard. Uh, so let's try that in there and see what happens uh, with Top Bench. Well, I have the original IBM EGA card in, so if I go into the real-time benchmarking and look at the numbers, uh, we can see immediately that we're getting 2230, which is much slower. I mean, this is an amount of time, so uh, higher is slower here. Uh, compared to the 1650 that we had uh, with the Paradise EGA card. So the original EGA implementation was indeed uh, substantially slower. And it's not terribly surprising. Uh, there's 80 nanosecond fast RAM on this later implementation. I don't think that the chipset uh, explains much of the difference here. I suspect it's mostly down to just video memory speed, as the, the benchmark itself indicates. Uh, so anyway, let's try some of the other EGA cards that I have and put them into context uh, compared to this original EGA implementation. Well, the next EGA card is this Chips and Technologies uh, EGA card, and I have shown this on the channel before, but we haven't run a top bench score on it. Uh, so let's pop that in and see how that compares to the other two. Well, here we have the top bench score, and you can see that it's actually around about the same speed as the original IBM. So this one runs at 2200 microseconds and uh, the original IBM was only 2230 so it's only just a tiny fraction faster and as a full length card you probably expect that I guess uh, the earlier the technology the more likely it is to run slowly. Uh, but I do have two other half-length cards that we can try. I've got an EJ Wonder and a Genoa card. Uh, so let's check those out and see if they perform more in line with the uh, Paradise EGA half-length card or whether they are trying to emulate the speed of the original IBM. These are the two cards here. This is the ATI EJ Wonder 800 Plus and this is the Genoa card. And uh, it looks like the RAM on this might be 256 kilobytes, just like we had on the uh, Paradise one. I'm not sure about this one, I don't recognize those chips. Uh, but otherwise, they're just both uh, late uh, 
half length cards. Uh, this one says 1988 on it, so it's even later than the Paradise one. And I don't see a date on this one, at least not on this side of the card. Uh, on the back there's pretty much nothing, so uh, I don't know when this one was made. Uh, but it'll be interesting to try it anyway and see uh, how it fits into the picture. Well, this is the ATI EJ Wonder 800 Plus, and uh, you might notice some flicker here. Now, I know that probably sounds like a joke because there's always flicker with this camera, but uh, apart from the, uh, the flicker that you're seeing on the really white areas, which of course is just the camera, the kind of rolling flicker, uh, if you can see some wobbling side to side and some flicker, especially over in this region, uh, going like this, that's actually visible to the naked eye. It's nothing to do with the camera. And you can see that this uh, screen extent here is less than it was with the other cards. So I suspect it's not 100% compatible with this monitor, or there may be a fault with the card. And uh, I think we've discussed it before. Now, uh, this is the benchmark, and at the moment it's 1780 roughly. Whoa! It just jumped up to 2000. Uh, so, that's interesting. Wait a minute. So, this is actually switching between a slow speed and a high speed alternately, it looks like. So, it goes down to almost as fast as the uh, Paradise card, down the, around the 1700 mark. And then almost as slow as the original IBM, up around the, in the 2000s. Uh, so that is really... well, I don't know how to explain that. If anyone has any ideas uh, what's going on here, apart from the possibility of a faulty card, of course, then leave a comment below. Uh, so that was quite unexpected. Uh, so anyway, now I'm going to switch over to the Genoa card, which I don't know if I've shown on the channel before, but uh, let's check that out and see how it goes. Well, this is the Genoa, and the only flicker that you're seeing here is just the ordinary camera flicker. There's a rock-steady picture on the screen at the moment. Uh, so let's go into the benchmarking and see how it performs. Wow, will you look at that. So this is 2230, which is exactly the speed of the original IBM EGA card. Uh, so it looks like instead of going for performance here, they've gone for exact emulation, uh, or at least speed-wise anyway. Uh, so that is remarkable. I hadn't predicted that at all. I would have thought, you know, being a half-length card, that they would have gone for, uh, you know, and therefore a later card, that they would have gone for the fastest possible uh, performance that they could get. So this is a surprise to me. And uh, actually the conclusion of this whole benchmark thing is that that Paradise EGA card that I repaired is actually now the fastest EGA card that I own. And if you exclude the ATI one, which you wouldn't want to use with this monitor anyway, uh, then it's by far the fastest. Uh, and so that means that it's been a really successful repair, for sure. Uh, so what I want to do now is go back to that Paradise CGI card and check out those extended modes, uh, the 64480 graphics mode and the 132 column text mode. Now, I don't know whether I can get those to work on my Amstrad EGA monitor. There's no reason that Amstrad would need to support those because they're not standard EGA modes. Uh, but we'll give it a go and see what happens. Uh, and hopefully uh, they'll work and we'll get to see what they're all about. Well, this is my Amstrad PC ECD monitor, which is an EGA monitor that came with the Amstrad's PC1640. And I'm in Fractint here, and I'm going to go into video modes and see if we can find something for the Paradise EGA card. Uh, so, I see a Paradise 800-600, but that's probably just VJ. I don't know how many EJ modes they'll have in here. Um, oh, there's a Paradise EJ 480, 640 uh, Untested, may not work. Uh, well, let's give it a go and see what happens. And uh, there's a lot of flicker there. It looks like th it's not supported by this monitor. Uh, that's a bit of a shame. I imagine that monitors, EGA monitors that support 640-480 are actually very rare. And uh, in fact, it may not even be possible to get one. Um, I, I think they're probably almost vanishingly rare. Uh, yeah, it seems like it's holding the picture okay. So the uh, the vertical refresh rate, rate must be about right, but the horizontal information you can see is just uh, scrolling across 
um, yeah you can see it's totally messed up here uh, that's really a shame but you can see that it is a graphics mode at least and uh, it wouldn't normally be on EGI and unfortunately I think we're going to have the same problem with the 132 column text mode uh, even if the pixels were uh, you know 640 by 480 uh, let's say 5 pixels per character would, would already put you over so um, it, it's definitely going to require 640-480 mode, uh, I think, to run that text mode. Uh, so there's no way that I'm going to be able to do that. Uh, so I think I'm going to leave it here for this week. Uh, that's really all I have time for anyway. Uh, but thanks very much for watching, and I hope that you enjoyed this uh, little repair video. Uh, I'm really happy with the result, at least for the EGO card. We will get back to uh, that... Uh, monitor at some point in the future. I have a few more ideas about that, uh, in particular about those optocouplers and what they're actually doing. They may be preventing the power supply from starting up for some reason. I also did some additional tests and noticed that I'm only getting 192 volts uh, instead of these well over 300 that we had before. So I think something's gone wrong with the diode rectifier. So given that we keep blowing up components as we repair others, um, it seems like there is uh, something quite wrong with um, some other part of the monitor, uh, overload for example. Uh, I did try disconnecting the little board that goes onto the back of the CRT because it is 12 volt overload protection that the monitor has, uh, but that wasn't the solution. Uh, so anyway, look out for that in a future video. I'll just, uh, you know, hack away at that problem a uh, little bit by little bit over the coming months and maybe eventually we'll have a video uh, for a successful repair of that. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, but again, a like and subscribe and we'll see you in a later video. Bye!